Hello traders, it's Wednesday, September the 6th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here you your market wrap-up for the past 24 hours. And more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the next 24 and bridging out to the next 48 hours ahead. Well, we opened up full liquidity for the week with the United States back online and all the uh, liquidity that that represents. And the results were not very encouraging, as you can see from a risk basis. The S&P 500, one of my preferred measures of risk trends because of its flaws, not uh, uh, despite them. Uh, but you can see that there certainly was a carryover of the uh, concerns related to North Korea, as well as the debt ceiling, uh, which seems to be uh, right front and center in the market's mind. But first, North Korea. Uh, North Korea at a UN summit, uh, its uh, UN ambassador suggested that there were more quote unquote gift packages for the United States, and this comes after. Uh, uh, the country re reportedly tested a hydrogen bomb uh, nuclear weapon. And uh, this was, if the market were open on Monday, we would have seen this already. But this is the U.S. market's first uh, opportunity to respond. And as you can see, it was a drop. It seems that most of the movements that we've seen through risk trends, these traditional assets as of late, have come either related to North Korea or concerns that the domestic agenda in, po in politics, uh, infrastructure and tax reform are uh, on the skids. So generally political uncertainty seems to be uh, at the very least keeping uh, risk taking from furthering its advance. Uh, but this is a pretty sizable uh, decline from the S&P 500, and inversely, uh, it was a pretty sizable jump in volatility. Now, we normally expect the VIX to normalize. It does deflate very quickly, if not continuously fed. Uh, but that might not be necessarily the case for the S&P 500. Buying the dip is not an absolute. Normalizing higher degrees of volatility from the average is. Uh, so keeping an eye on that. But what was noteworthy is we didn't get a continuation or escalation necessarily of risk-oriented assets. Now consider, the markets were open on Monday for much the rest of the world, and we did see the risk response. But just because the U.S. markets were now open and we, open and we in turn saw further risk aversion from U.S. shares did not mean that it would carry through for a second day. Uh, for the DAX, uh, we would have some follow through from the FTSE 100. Uh, we would not necessarily see the greatest intensity from the Nikkei 225, although some follow through here as well. Uh, we have the yen crosses all right, moving up on support perhaps more the U.S. dollar, because if you look at the Euro Yen, the Pound Yen, uh, the Aussie Yen, they were uneven at best. All right, so the Yen crosses were not sustaining or escalating the risk aversion. Uh, further, we have the likes of the emerging markets and the uh, junk bond indices, and they would not see the high profile risk aversion, even though these were actually closed for Monday as well. So not a universal risk aversion. But it has the capacity to be, uh, because the the risks uh, of a military engagement between North Korea and the U.S. or uh, other Western powers uh, can have very profound influences, because the inclusion of nuclear weapons always makes it a far more riskier situation. So risk certainly hanging over the market but not a proactive enough driver to really overcome complacency. You have to question, uh, if not nuclear weapon threats, what can overcome complacency? It's pretty remarkable. But one thing that certainly uh, is adding its own influence is the debt ceiling concerns. Uh, so US, uh, the U.S. Con Congress is back from its recess, and they have just a couple of weeks uh, to answer some very pressing issues. One of those is the debt ceiling. Uh, and as I've said before, the debt ceiling is something that has to be resolved. All right, because it can have not just a profound impact on the dollar, uh, the S&P 500, and treasuries, uh, although absolutely it has a profound influence here, uh, but it also has a just a global negative impact. Uh, 
because U.S. Treasuries are used as cash equivalency. They are our risk-free assets, whether you are a fund manager in Europe, in Asia, or the United States, that is a certain portion of your funds set aside for absolute safety. If we undermine that, then there is a scramble to find an alternative, and there is no good alternative. Treasuries themselves are not risk-free. Obviously, we would not be in this position uh, if that were the case. But there is a lot of dependency on the safety that these assets imply, which instantly becomes suspect. If the U.S. government uh, is even late on one bill, because that is definitely going to instigate a credit rating downgrade from the two holdouts, Moody's and Fitch. Even if we don't actually get a government shutdown or a late payment on, on debt, it is going to very likely raise the specter even further that they should be downgraded because this is not a resolved issue. Neither a budget and also the fact that we uh, ha keep coming to these uh, standoffs, these cliffhangers. And that is a very big problem because now we have to consider how do we diversify? What is actually safe and what's the alternative? Now the biggest loser in such an event is without a doubt the dollar, all right? Because it is the world's most liquid uh, safe haven currency, the most liquid reserve currency. But if you see this kind of threat, it's going to immediately take a hit as a reserve. If there is a downgrade, absolutely this loses a significant portion of its reserve status. People will start using SDR equivalencies, which is a, a basket of uh, uh, sovereign drawing, drawing rights, which is a basket of reserves, where they're going to diversify into the next uh, most liquid of the reserve currencies, the euro, the pound, and the yen. The euro would gain the greatest uh, uh, strength from this kind of outcome uh, because, one, it's the second most liquid reserve currency, and two, because it is generally in a relatively strong footing right now. Even if the ECB were to say, no, absolutely not, we're going to contain or continue its, uh, our uh, stimulus program into 2018, between that and seeing the U.S. dollar res lose reserve status because of a downgrade in its credit rating, it's going to be the euro that comes out on top of the dollar. That's how important this is. All right. I cannot stress enough the kind of problems that this would force. But the immediate risk relies on the dollar. I think at the same time, given the concern that is baked into this uh, event, if it is raised, if the debt ceiling is raised, and this is not a immediate risk, uh, an imminent risk, if we see that the uh, credit rating agencies say, well, that's positive because it's out of the way, uh, we'll look into the future to see uh, any judgments on future forecast. Uh, so in essence, not making any calls and saying, well, we're not happy that this keeps coming up. Uh, if this de-escalates, the dollar can very well uh, rally. And not because of the Fed, but because of an imminent risk that has been, no doubt, uh, seeing a discount in the greenback, would be uh, lifted, and subsequently there's a, a bounce from the dollar. And that could ultimately be what turns the EURUSD, uh, rather than a Fed versus ECB thing in September. Uh, but this is definitely a fundamental theme that has risk implications as well as dollar implications and U.S. assets and, and, and implications. Uh, we saw the impact this had actually uh, in uh, bond auctions uh, this past session. In fact, we had a $20 billion uh, sale of one-month bills, and their uh, yield was the highest since 2008 amid the great financial crisis, uh, because there's obviously a great concern here related to debt ceiling, though a percentage of that goes to the fact that interest rates are higher. Uh, it's still a reflection of some risk premium certainly factored into this market. All right. You can see this impacting the dollar, keeping it low, the S&P 500 contributing to risk aversion, and certainly through Treasury uh, ETFs, these yields are rising. Um, here's TBT, the inverse, the actual performance uh, of yield, but um, it's definitely factoring in. Now, going forward, uh, we will see if there's a 
competition for the dollar uh, between the debt ceiling, which is going to be very important, risk trends, which obviously is a spillover of uh, the North Korea concerns, uh, but also monetary policy, which seems kind of mundane. Uh, there isn't a, a clear monetary policy driver for the Fed and the dollar this week, uh, but we do have the BOC in the upcoming session, the ECB, the subsequent session. So it is a good uh, contrast. And remember, it's always about the environment or relative monetary policy, not absolute monetary policy. What's the Fed doing tomorrow? It's more so what's the Fed doing relative to what the ECB is doing. All right, so that can definitely be an additional fundamental factor. And on the monetary policy front, we had a couple of Fed speakers that just happened to be the two biggest doves on the uh, policy group, uh, Bernard and, and Kashkari. Uh, Bernard was essentially cautious on future hikes, warned of the weak inflation, and said core GDP was uh, firming, which is, for a hawk, pretty neutral. Uh, but it was Kashkari who suggested that rate hikes that we've already put into place are already potentially harming the economy, which... I take issue with because it insinuates that even if we didn't uh, see the tightening, that we would stay near essentially crisis level monetary policy, uh, essentially zero interest rates with still an extremely large balance sheet. So tons of stimulus in the system. And if that is the case, that issue in there, the economy and the financial system are still unsound despite that, despite crisis era support then we're in a much worse position than uh, just holding policy very loose. We should be doing something far more proactive to encourage growth, to encourage financial stability. And they, they would be very derelict in duty if they weren't doing more. So is the situation really that bad? If so, investors should be really concerned. Uh, I think that it's a bit of exaggeration, which is why it's a minority voice, but uh, it really, the strategy from the monetary policy perspective has to be called into question if that is the case. I think generally monetary policy is too dovish globally and has in turn started to have negative impact on uh, the capital markets. Assumptions of low volatility have really increased uh, risk taking, which is itself uh, a potential destabilizing factor. But that is kind of the, the perhaps not as intense as, uh, as Kashkari, but that is a general state of being and anticipation for the markets that I think really puts us at risk. Now, in contrast to the Fed, uh, we had the RBA rate decision uh, this past session, and they were absolutely neutral. Uh, there was no anticipation of this being a profound market moving event, and it certainly met expectations in that manner. Uh, the Australian dollar was not a very profound market mover. Uh, the Aussie USD is still very close on a close over close basis uh, to the high that it set back here, uh, or the high that it had at the uh, July swing high, which is comparable to two year plus uh, previous swing. Uh, we are not making progress on this trend, so we need something to really undermine the dollar or to really lift the Australian dollar. This didn't lift the Australian dollar, though. Uh, you can see that lack of lift also with the Aussie yen, the pound Aussie, but arguably uh, the most remarkable of the Aussie-based crosses, and my favorite is the Aussie kiwi, because they're Aussie and kiwi and RBA and RBNZ are in the same spot, and yet the Australian dollar has been really outperforming, especially over the past month. So that being said, if they're in the same spot, this looks like excess premium, which is starting to pull back. And you can see there's a lot of technical precedents in this. Uh, so very impressive, very remarkable uh, uh, productivity. Now there is some event risk ahead, Australian GDP, keep that in mind, uh, but very remarkable move. Now, in the upcoming session, we have another rate decision, the Bank of Canada rate decision. This holds considerable uh, uh, impact potential because expectations are for 40% probability of a rate hike, uh, which is a very high anticipation. That means that this one-sided move for the Canadian dollar, which it has been very one-sided over the past three months and a very profound momentum here, uh, it puts it at risk of having to live up to those expectations. If not, it can be deflated. Now, I, I really focus in on a strategy video uh, relating to the Bank of Canada strategy, so you, I'll, I'll leave it to that uh, to really go into the detail. But generally speaking, my favorite uh, bearish Canadian dollar outcome would come from KiwiCat. Uh, the best opportunity for an appreciation of the Canadian dollar would come with the Aussie Cat. 
but this all depends, however, on how the Aussie GDP figures come across the wires, too. Uh, but we'll have crossed that threshold by the time we get to the BOC. Now, aside from these remarkable moves, uh, some other very uh, impressive uh, non-thematic uh, developments that we've seen recently, uh, the cryptocurrency world uh, has certainly slowed from its uh, epic tumble uh, on Monday on news that China had banned ICOs and that South Korea, uh, South Korea was cracking down on regulations for them. That was true of Bitcoin, that was true of Ethereum, that was true of Ripple, and up and down the uh, digital currency curve. Uh, so uh, some reprieve for those that have some exposure here, a little bit of a sigh of relief, but be mindful, these will remain volatile because this is very heavily speculative oriented. Meanwhile, oil finally got a rebound. Now, if you recall, Harvey, uh, the hurricane and uh, that struck Houston and flooded it, uh, had actually cut down the refinery uh, capacity of uh, raw crude into uh, distillates like gasoline, which led gasoline to surge, but crude to sink uh, because the amount of unprocessed, unrefined crude uh, was just building up in the system. Uh, this time, however, as Irma uh, approaches the Caribbean islands, uh, a, p a possible devastating five category uh, hurricane, uh, you can see that this is a pickup. So uh, again, this is related to Harvey uh, passing, Harvey impact on the refineries passing and they're coming back online, but also uncertainty with Irma. I still don't think this gives a very clear, consistent trend for the commodity market going forward, but do watch it. And uh, as we've been learned, also watch uh, gasoline uh, futures. All right. Now, next we have gold, which gold has continued to advance. Uh, we had that uh, gap higher on Monday with the markets offline, uh, but we did have continuation on Tuesday. Uh, so with U.S. markets online risk aversion and obviously the threat to the U.S. financial system and economy in particular uh, are hanging heavy here, but it's still a slow advance. This is a safe haven, especially if we see a safe haven demand that uh, perhaps navigates capital away from the U.S. dollar. Uh, meaning undermines the major currency in the real world, and obviously reserves squirt to other currencies like the euro, the yen, and the pound. Uh, but when you undermine the dollar, uh, you generally start to look for non-currency alternatives. Gold happens to be one of them. And the last place I want to look, because I haven't looked in it in a while, and I just noticed it during one of my uh, the Q and A's this week, uh, is this massive tumble from the dollar CNH, uh, which. That was actually the most consistent tumble from this exchange rate since it started trading. Uh, we've had a lot longer, obviously, USDC and Y, uh, but this is uh, the CNH, which only goes back to May 2012, uh, and that's just been precipitous. Although I do think that policy officials are going to step in in China and uh, put a floor underneath it. But we'll see if it's uh, at an absolute level and if they intend to really lift it aggressively. But that has been very impressive and uh, perhaps takes a lot of the pressure out of the uh, threat of, uh, of being condemned as a currency manipulator, at least for the short term, and stabilizes things potentially before the Chinese Congress uh, happens on October the 18th. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets uh, tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.